Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And in this lecture, we're gonna learn about the ice giants and bone flutes and sneaky little hobbits and dragons and sunken ships and broken teeth. And we're gonna follow that outline right up above my little yellow box and learn all about those guys on the left, the many different humans, the many different species of humans that once inhabited the earth. Because you see, if you or I travel back in time, say a, a quarter of a million years or so ago, we would find not one, but four distinct human species. Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo floriensis, and the, the Denisovans, like whatever the Denisovans were, all scattered across the old world. And all of this comes out of the erectus radiation. Homo erectus migrates out of Africa. They settle Europe, they settle South and East Asia, they settle the islands of Indonesia, and then Homo erectus goes extinct. They go extinct sometime around 400,000 years ago, although that's debated. But Homo erectus doesn't go extinct because it's outcompeted by a superior animal. They don't go extinct because of some, you know, catastrophic climate change. Rather, Homo erectus goes extinct through a series of multiple pseudo-extinctions because Homo erectus speciates into these different multiple human species, each of them adapting to a broad environmental region of the earth. For instance, in Africa, you have Homo sapiens, but in Europe and West Asia, those are Homo neanderthalensis. Down in the islands of Indonesia are Homo floriensis, and the Denisovans, again, whatever the Denisovans were, in East and South Asia. And we're going to address each of these guys in turn, starting with the best known of them, Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals. They had very odd looking skulls. If they were alive today, there have been several pretty good recreations of what Neanderthals would have looked like. Uh, there is one from, a, I think that's from a French museum, but it's often been said that Neanderthals really weren't that different. And if you dressed them up and didn't sort of dress them up like cavemen, if you put them in modern business suits with modern haircuts, they would look just like you or I. And that's absolutely wrong because we absolutely know what they would look like in modern clothes. This is from the Neanderthal Museum uh, in Germany. And there is a Neanderthal reconstruction in, a, in modern business attire uh, with a modern haircut. And he looks very, very strange. If you encountered this man walking down the street, you would have to try not to stare because they are very odd looking people because they had very odd looking skulls. And I really love this recreation because he's holding a Mousterian stone point in one hand. So let's actually get in to the skeletal anatomy of Neanderthals. Now, Homo neanderthalensis generally appears around 250,000 years ago, and they lasted until about 32,000 years ago, pretty recently. And overall, the bones are just much larger than any modern Homo sapiens. Basically, all of the robust features of Homo erectus were basically magnified. They were enlarged. Neanderthal remains, Neanderthal skeletons are very, very distinct. And like we saw previously, a living Neanderthal would be a very unusual looking fellow indeed. I mean, just look at that skull, but let's compare it to a Homo sapiens skull. And that's what you see right up above me. Um, on the left is Homo neanderthalensis, and on the right is, you know, you or I, Homo sapiens. Very different looking skulls. Neanderthal craniums possessed uh, a, a pronounced occipital bun, which is to say as the brain expanded, it didn't expand out like it did with the African Homo sapiens, but rather towards the rear, producing this long, low skull. And one of the things Neanderthal craniums had was a large brow ridge, generally to shield the eyes from the sun and allow for muscle attachments for these huge masseter muscles on either side of the head. They possessed a very large nasal cavity. Indeed, one of the key attributes that allows you to recognize Neanderthals very easily is these huge nasal cavities. They must have had massive flat noses and a particularly large and pronounced mastoid, indicating a heavy emphasis on mastication. I mean, look at the Neanderthal jaw as compared to the Homo sapiens jaw. It's almost twice the size. 
So these guys are using their jaws a lot. A receding forehead. These guys did not have very big or broad foreheads. Again, their skulls are low and long, not sort of high and large like sapien skulls. And almost no chin whatsoever. The, the jawbone slopes right back from the mouth. Very, very interesting, very distinct skulls. And you can see everything about them is bigger, heavier, more robust. And one of those things included their brains. Neanderthals had a very large brain case, which indicates that they had a brain that ranged from 1400 to 1600 cubic centimeters, which means Neanderthal brains are larger than the brains of Homo sapiens. Now, does that mean that they were necessarily smarter? The answer is probably not. As we'll, as we'll discover, the size of the brain is not a good indicator or not a precise indicator of uh, the level of intelligence. They probably simply had a bigger brain because everything about the Neanderthal was bigger and denser and more robust than uh, the Homo sapiens. And this is not only apparent with the cranium, it's really apparent with the postcranial anatomy. I mean, look at those two skeletons in comparison. The left is the Neanderthal, the right is the modern Homo sapien. Neanderthals were much larger uh, than uh, modern sapiens. And I don't mean taller, but basically larger in every single aspect. They stood roughly equal to human height, if not just a touch shorter being about 1.6 to about 1.8 meters tall. That's 5'6 to 5'9 in freedom units. But they were much, much stockier. Basically, they have 20% more body mass uh, than Homo sapiens. And most of that extra body mass would have been muscle. Look at the size of those bones. Big, heavy bones means big, heavy muscles because the muscle has to attach to the bone so both of them can move and a massive barrel-shaped chest. These things would have been amazing. In fact, you know, Neanderthals would have made the best defensive linemen the world has ever seen. They would have been great at football. But let's actually look at some of the key attributes of uh, the Neanderthal skeleton from the neck down. Basically, large, broad collarbones. Big, broad collarbones. And that means heavy, heavy chest muscles. Short, curved scapulas. So the, the scapulas, the muscles on the back of the body, were also short and curved, which means massive back muscles as well. A broad iliac surface, and that's that curve on the hip right there, which indicates, a again, massive and significant muscle masses on the front and the back of the legs. These guys were just heavy slabs of meat large, robust femurs. That's what all of that muscle is going to be moving. But look at their legs. Their legs really aren't that long proportionally, which indicates that these guys are built for power, not speed. You can't outpower lift a Neanderthal, but a Homo sapien could probably outrun him. Now, where did these guys live? They lived, well, in Western uh, Asia and in Europe, ranging all the way from Israel to Spain and Britain. And they had this, uh, this pretty restricted area being exclusively found in Europe uh, and in portions of the Middle East and in West Asia. And this is the Pleistocene. This is a period of time in which large portions of Europe are covered by massive glaciers. These guys are big. They're living in, the, in an area of frozen Europe. They're the ice giants. They're ice giants. And the, this, this Pleistocene, this, this geologic period, is marked by repeated glacial cycles taking place in Europe because the glaciers don't stay where they are. They advance and retreat. They advance and retreat. You know, and over the 200,000 years the Neanderthals lived in Europe, they experienced various warming and cooling cycles. And, but basically, much of Europe does not look like the Europe of today. Much of Europe uh, back then, in the, in the days of the Neanderthals, would have looked like northern Alaska. It would have looked like northern Canada. You would have had frozen taiga, tundra, and heavy, wet, cold forests dotting the area uh, across Europe today. But their material culture indicates, you know, these are not, these are not dummy cavemen, you know, you know, hulking around in caves. Their material culture is every bit as complex as the contemporary Homo sapiens down in Africa. 
Uh, their, their tools consisted of a fairly complex stone toolkit called Mousterian tools. And, and there's some example of Mousterian tools right there. Mousterian tools uh, contained a series of blades, scrapers, burns, hammer stones, and bifacial points. And this is in addition to a number of curved bone and wooden points that have been found. So basically these guys have big spears. And there is uh, the debate over whether Neanderthals had projectile weapons or not is kind of small, but really intense. And uh, I, I don't know how convincing any of the arguments are, but basically these guys have a toolkit geared towards hunting and meat processing. And we'll come back to that point in a bit, but it's not just big blades these guys are found with. They've often, they've also been associated with flutes. Uh, here is a femur that has been carved into a bone flute. So Neanderthals at some time sat around a campfire in the heavy, wet, cold woods of Europe, you know, sharpening their stone knives. And someone, one of these huge ice giants, played a stone flute. And there also might be artwork associated with Neanderthals. Here are the Nerha cave paintings. Now these cave paintings have been radiocarbon dated to about 43 to 42,000 uh, BC, which means that there were Neanderthals in the area. There are paintings uh, inside these caves. And it's very likely a Neanderthal artist painted these cave works. Now their toolkit, those Mosterian tools, again, seem geared primarily towards the hunting and processing of large game animals. Neanderthals don't seem to be going for rabbits or deer. They're going for large reindeer. They're going for woolly mammoths. They're going for woolly rhinoceroses. These guys are into meat. From the analysis of bone collagen, especially noting the levels of uh, C13 as compared to N15, uh, indicates the degree of dietary protein because your bones actually record how much meat you're eating and your bones uh, uh, mirror uh, your own dietary intake, which is why you should eat healthy. Anyway, when they did this study of Neanderthal bones, they concluded that the diet of Neanderthals consists almost entirely of animal protein. Something like 80 to 90% of their diet is meat. They're into meat. And this should not be surprising. This is what Pleistocene Europe would have looked like. Ice Age Europe. This would have been a land of woolly rhinoceroses, you know, large uh, herds of deer, mammoths. This is the type of animal that these ice giants are hunting in these wet, cold, massive forests of Europe. And let's go back to that analysis of bone collagen. If you look at that chart there on the upper left, uh, the White squ the white squares are human dietary protein with the higher the level being the greater the amount of animal uh, meat that's in the diet. And you can see, you know, those gray circles are Neanderthals. Basically, the most meat heavy diet of Homo sapiens is pretty much the average Neanderthal diet. Again, a high degree of animal protein and the high degree of animal protein that they're consuming has been recorded in their bones. And again, we should not really be surprised with this. On modern human populations that live in really cold environments, like the Inuit of Alaska and Northern Canada, these guys who hunt seals and hunt caribou, again, something like 70, 80% of their, of their diet is animal meat. So the, these ice giants ate a lot of meat. Neanderthals also seem to have cared for their dead. They seem to have buried their dead. Uh, look at this skeleton to the left. You can tell it's a Neanderthal. Look at that huge nasal cavity. Look at those huge brow ridges. This is clearly a Neanderthal. My God, look at the size of those femurs. Anyway, this is a Neanderthal burial. And the interesting thing about this burial is that position, sort of in the fetal position with the knees drawn up to the chest and the arms over the chest, this is not the position that the body assumes upon death. In other words, this individual was bundled. He was placed into this position and probably wrapped in either a cloth or an animal skin and then buried. There is a debate about uh, floral pollen, which has been found around some of these burials. Some people say, oh, this is just accidental. They just buried this person in the spring and then the floral pollen just made it into the burial. But another argument has said, 
that they are placing flowers into the grave sites as they bury their dead. So pretty much all of these things, the art, the bones, uh, the bone flutes, uh, the stone knives, all of these things indicate that the Neanderthals probably possessed a culture every bit as rich and varied as our own. They had their stories, they had their legends, they had their music. Uh, now, the terminology gets a little loose here, but these are humans. These are humans unlike any humans you or I have ever met a different kind of humanity. And absolutely everything about the Neanderthal form. The big lungs, it's been argued, are there to hold a reservoir of warm air. The big noses, it's been argued, heat the air as it's pulled into the body so they don't get big stuffy noses <laughs> during these glacial winters. To the stocky and powerful form, all of this indicates that Neanderthals are adapted to very rugged, very cold conditions. The Homo erectuses moved into Europe, began to adapt to this glacial environment, and became Neanderthals. But the Neanderthals do not last. They're only around for, you know, 200,000, 250,000 years. And the Neanderthal story doesn't end well. I mean, nobody living has ever met a Neanderthal. Now, Neanderthals go extinct somewhere around 24,000 to 32,000 years ago, and the last population of Neanderthals seems to be placed in sort of coastal uh, southern Spain. And as for the reasons, the Neanderthals uh, went extinct because of uh, reasons that absolutely no one knows. Uh, nobody really knows why the Neanderthals went extinct. It could be a big climate change, but... Neanderthals go extinct before the end of the Ice Age, and they had survived these big glacial shifts in, in Europe, these warming and cooling trends. Was it competition? Did Homo sapiens come up from Africa and just outcompete them? Maybe, but it's difficult to imagine how a group of humans adapted for life in Africa are going to outcompete a group of humans adapted to life in glacial Europe, Pleistocene Europe. Interbreeding? Maybe they just interbred with the humans that were moving up and they were just absorbed into the sapiens population? Possible, but unlikely. Uh, you know, there's, there's just not that much Neanderthal DNA in modern populations. There's a tiny, tiny amount. And we'll talk about that in just a tick. So the, the, the reason is absolutely no one knows why the Neanderthals went extinct. One of the things we do know about the Neanderthals is that there does not appear to have ever been a large number of them. And this is a, a pretty recent study. It was, it's from 2012. And basically what they were looking at is the degree of genetic diversity present in these Neanderthal populations. So they went into all of these Neanderthal teeth and they drilled in them to get a pure DNA sample. And they just started measuring the range of DNA and they found some really interesting things. If you look at that chart on the left, all of those big purple and green and black curves, that's modern Homo sapiens uh, genetic diversity. But if you look at those vertical lines, like at the top column, you have these two skinny vertical lines. For that one genome, that's it for genetic diversity, a tiny sliver. And if you look at the bottom chart, those two red vertical lines, not a lot of genetic diversity. And because there's not a lot of genetic diversity, the argument has been there were never a lot of Neanderthals. You know, as for the number, I mean, you, you pick these numbers out of thin air, but it's not a lot of Neanderthals. In Ice Age Europe, in these huge, wet, cold forests, there's just not a lot of these guys. And there never were. But one of the more interesting things about Neanderthals, and this is where we cue the Barry White music, is did Homo sapiens, modern humans, and Neanderthals interbreed? Again, they got the big heads, they got the rugged bones, they've got the brow ridges and the big noses, and that is some sexy, sexy caveman stuff right there. The argument about a genetic, genetic uh, exchange between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis was a really bitter argument in the early 2000s, and it went back and forth. You, know, you can see the above article, modern humans did not admix with Neanderthals, or a draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome, which argued that it did. And basically, the yeas seem to have won this argument. 
that basically everyone accepts now that somewhere between one and three or four percent of the European DNA, uh, European DNA is of Neanderthal origin. So there seems to have been some degree of genetic exchange, some degree of interbreeding. But one of the odder things is that the, the genetic exchange only seems to have gone in one direction. Because one of the un more unusual things about you know, interbreeding with Neanderthals is that they've never encountered any mitochondrial DNA from Neanderthals. And basically, five-minute genetics. You've basically got more, multiple types of DNA in your system. You have nuclear DNA. You get 50% from mom and 50% from dad. But you have mitochondrial DNA. Your mitochondrial DNA comes 100% from your mother. You inherit no mDNA from your male parent. And all of the Neanderthal DNA seems to be nuclear. None of it, at least to date, is mitochondrial. So if Homo sapiens and Neanderthals interbred, all we're really talking about is male Neanderthals and female Homo sapiens. Maybe. Uh, what that means, I have no idea. Again, I'm a Maya archaeologist. This is, I just read a lot of articles. And that's it for Neanderthals. We're going to move on to our tiny little island cousins out in Indonesia, Homo floriensis, because these guys are small. And that's the really interesting thing about Homo floriensis. And they were only discovered in the last 20 years or so. And But you see, the thing about these Homo floriensis, about these small humans, is that they lived in cozy holes in the ground. And it was thought for many years, through most of the 20th century, that basically you have Homo erectus, and Homo erectus splits into Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis, and that was that. That was the argument. However, in 2003, a team of anatomists and anthropologists uh, were digging in a series of sites on the island of Flores in Indonesia. And what they discovered was a series of human remains. And at first they thought these might have been dwarfs or these might be a pygmy human population. But what it really, what they noticed right off the bat is that the genetic markers that they saw were all uniform. And you wouldn't see that in a population of dwarfs or a population of pygmies. Each of the different aspects of, of you know, microcephaly would have been slightly different. But these skeletons they found in this cave in, in Indonesia were all the same. In other words, this was truly a new species. Now, here's a series of maps. Uh, that is the Long Buang Cave, and you can see where they excavated, and in fact, you can see where apparently they were buried. And they would live in the cave, but they would bury their dead off on the sides of the cave. Uh, and there is the burial of one of these Homo floriensis uh, right there. And if you look at the map at the top, you can see the cave is even well situated. It's a high drive cave. It's a cozy hole in the ground. And it looks down on a river valley that leads to the sea. It really is a great place uh, to build your home. And inside this cave, in the initial 2003 find, eight individuals were found with, the, again, the same set of physical features on these skeletons. And again, this set of physical features would be very unusual in a small or a really inbred Homo sapiens population. But these guys are not small. I mean, they're not deformed. They're not suffering from microcephaly, uh, microcephaly which is like dwarfism or midgetism. But they are small. I mean, look at that skull. It, it fits in the researcher's hands. And the thing is, the same time they find these skeletons, you know, the Lord of the Rings movies are just hitting big time. So basically... It's Homo floriensis is the official scientific name, but everyone at the time and everyone since then, including the original researchers, they just call them hobbits. They just call them hobbits. So yes, you have hobbits and they lived in a cozy hole in the ground, overlooking a river that went into the sea. Now here's the most complete skeleton found to date. It's a biological female called LB1. It's a very sexy name. Uh, the individual stands 39 inches tall basically just over one meter. And let's examine the skeleton in some detail. We have a very short clavicle and a long humerus, which means big, long arms. They're only 39 inches tall, but their arms are pretty much as long as the arms of Homo sapiens. They're as long as our arms. They have distinct metacarpal bones, unlike any contemporary human. So their hands 
are quite large and long. And here's a weird thing. They've got even got big feet. They have long feet that lacked any kind of arch and were disproportionately large to their bodies. If you look at those foot bones there uh, on the left, the large one is the uh, Homo sapiens foot, and the smaller one to its left is the Homo floriensis foot. But you can see that proportional to their size, 39 inches tall, they've got big feet. They have long arms and big feet. And if they would have moved, these guys are not runners. They would have kind of had a, a really odd kind of waddling gait. And with these long arms, they're pretty much well suited for climbing in trees or rock faces or up to these remote caves. So yeah, they had big feet. Let's actually look at the skulls. Uh, there on the right is the Homo sapiens skull. On the left is the Homo floriensis skull. Again, much smaller. And their cranial remains indicate some really interesting things. For one, they have very, very human-like teeth. Their teeth are the same as our teeth. You know, incisors, canines, uh, bicuspids, and molars. And this indicates a similar diet. Highly opportunistic, highly omnivorous. These guys are not eating 80, 90% of their diet being meat. They have a pretty small brain. They have 400 cubic centimeter brain. It's basically a brain that's smaller than the brain of modern chimpanzees. But as we'll see, their brains are very oddly constructed or, or what we've been able to reconstruct of their brains. They have pronounced brow ridges, which again indicates pretty big masseter muscles on the sides of their heads and a large mastoid, which lacked, again, just like Neanderthals, lack any kind of chin. So these guys are using their jaws very, very regularly like the Neanderthals were. And let's actually focus in on that Floriensis brain. Because I added this bit, I would have with students, I would say, oh, their brains were smaller than modern chimpanzees. And all of the students in my classes would go, oh, they're, they're, they're just like chimps. They're not really people, people. No. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting about their brains is their brains were small, but highly compacted. And their brains were odd. Again, they have brains that are smaller than the brains of chimpanzees, yet scans of the brain cavities of these skulls have yielded a computer model of the hobbit brain. And the brain possesses the same kind of dense, compact nature that one sees with modern dwarfs. That you see, you have people that are born with microcephaly, they're born dwarfs, they're born little, but they have these dense brains because, you know, they're every bit as smart as you or I. I mean, I'd probably lose a game of chess to Peter Dinklage in a second because I'm not very good at chess. Anyway, in other words, they possess a brain structure that is evidence of a decreasing proportional brain size, but as their brains shrank, they became denser. Uh, so it means, one, these guys are fully intelligent individuals. You could sit down with a Homo floriensis, and if both of you knew how to play chess, he could beat you about half of the time, or she. And two, it suggests that they come from ancestors with much larger brains. In other words, the structure of their brain, having compacted, strongly suggests Homo erectus ancestry. Uh, and I want to study, I want to focus in on this chart uh, up there. This is from the same study, and it's it's linked right over there. Uh, basically, if you look at uh, these, these brain compactness uh, chart right up above me, you've got the normal uh, modern human range of brain size, size versus compactness. And that's got a great name for it, normalocephaly. Uh, and, and that's the white circle. Uh, and the gray area... That is people, that is modern humans that are born um, with microcephaly. They're dwarfs, they're midgets. And you can see they've got brains, they're just compacted, but they're every bit as intelligent and sentient as you or I. And the, the dark circle, the black circle, that's LB1. That's the skeleton we just met. And her brain resembles the brains of modern humans who are microcephalic. In other words, just because they had little brains doesn't mean they were dumb. They were just as smart as any other human. Again, brain size is not necessarily a precise indicator of intelligence. And we know they're intelligent because they're making tools. They're making these stone, little stone points. Homo floriensis is directly archeologically associated with a tool complex that consists of these sort of micro blades, these small flaked tools. They're small, they're very sharp. I mean, you can see how small they are in the chart right up above. 
And the tool complex itself has a very good uh, set of dates to it. And this is how this is how we know that the dates are attached to uh, these hobbits. Applied to the hobbits, this means the hobbits more, are more or less in their modern form around 100,000 years ago, and they go extinct right around 12,000 years ago. And anyway, these guys, they're associated with fires. They're living in these big open mouth caves. They're burying their ancestors along the sides of these caves and they're hunting animals across the island. And in fact, their main prey appears to be an animal known as a stegodon. And stegodons are a sort of a dwarfish uh, cousin of the modern elephant. Stegodons are extinct, but they inhabited Flores until about 12,000 years ago. The stegodons go extinct at roughly the same time that the hobbits do. And again, stegodons are an extinct pygmy species of East Asian elephant. Uh, you can see that chart on the left. There's the Indian elephant and its stegodontid pygmy cousin. Uh, and again, these are a dwarf species. They stood about, these, these cute little elephants were about five feet high at the shoulder. They inhabited the tropical forests of Indonesia. They were hunted uh, by the hobbits. But you see, there is an apex predator in Indonesia that might have hunted the hobbits. And the hobbits would have had to deal with these very, very dangerous dragons, Komodo dragons. These are the Komodo dragons, and that's what Komodo dragons look like. Komodo dragons are incredibly dangerous. They are large, alligator-sized ground lizards. They are the apex predators of, you know, a dozen different islands scattered across Indonesia. They can get up to nine feet long. They can weigh up to 300 pounds. They drool an infectious venom constantly from their mouths. Komodos would have been a formidable opponent of our Floriensis. So yeah, hobbits would have had to worry about dragons. There is no evidence of any rings of power though. So at least not yet. So anyway, now, Homo sapiens appear in Indonesia around 50,000 years ago. And indeed, this is what the archaeologists were actually looking for back in 2003. They weren't expecting to find, you know, an entire new civilization of hobbits. They were just trying to look at human colonization, Homo sapiens colonization of Indonesia. But basically, one of the more unusual things this means is that Homo sapiens were on the islands of Indonesia at the exact same time that Homo floriensis were. Modern humans and hobbits coexisted for about 50,000 years on these islands together. And indeed, in modern Indonesia, there are legends. There's legends of these, these people that live in the deep, deep forests, in caves. These are called the Idu Gogo, hairy elf-like creatures who lived in the interior of these jungle islands, whereas the you know, modern Homo sapiens tended to live on, on the coasts. And the research on Floriensis is still unfolding. We have no, like, reason why they went extinct. We don't actually know their exact geochronological range because it's sometimes they say, the people of Indonesia still say, at night, back, back in the forests, the Idu Gogo are still there. Ooh. That would actually be really cool. That'd be like awesome if they were still there. And again, uh, somewhere between about 15,000 to 12,000 BC, hobbits go extinct on Flores and they go extinct probably on the rest of Indonesia as well. And as for the reasons why, we still have absolutely no idea. Uh, we're right back where we were with the Neanderthals. It could be catastrophic climate change. It could be brutal competition. Maybe the Homo sapiens hunted them all and killed them. Maybe it's interbreeding. We don't really have good enough genetic information to determine if there was hobbit-human genetic exchange. Uh, but yeah, pretty much nobody really knows why they went extinct. And now we're dealing with the daughter species of Homo erectus. We've dealt with the Neanderthals. We've dealt with the hobbits. And now we're going to move on to, you know, the fourth species, a very poorly understood species. I mean, we've already got Neanderthals, we've got hobbits, and now we have Denisovans. And um, the story of the Denisovans starts 
with the very sad story of a group of fossils known as Peking Man. Keith will now tell the sad story of Peking Man. Okay, sad story of Peking Man. Basically, a series of very unusual fossils were found in China in the 1920s and in the 1930s. They were very unusual. They didn't really look like any human species that we knew about. They sort of looked like the Java Man fossils that Eugene Dubois found, you know, uh, down, in, down in Indonesia. We really didn't know what they looked like. What we do know is they took lots of pictures. And if you look at those skulls uh, right at the top, these are reconstructions that have been made from these bad photographs that were taken in the 1920s and 1930s. And you can see they they kind of look like Homo erectus, but the brains are too big. They, they're not big enough to look like Neanderthals. They're too big to look like Floriensis. Uh, and they're definitely not Homo sapiens. So people really didn't know what these fossils were. And they were called Peking Man. And they were in China for years and years. And then, you know, as the political situation in the 1930s in China began to deteriorate, I mean, the Empire of Japan invaded China in 1932. Uh, the idea was, look, we got to get these fossils out of China. They're too important. Uh, they're too unusual. We have to get them to someplace safe, either a university or college in the United States or, or in Britain. So they took these fossils and they loaded them on a ship and they sailed out and they said, well, it's December of 1941, so they should make it to San Francisco in a few months. They never made it to San Francisco. And there's been a couple different stories about what actually happened to the ship because the war was going on and then World War II took place and records got shuffled and burned and cities fell apart. And, uh, you know, maybe the ship they were on was torpedoed and the Peking Man fossils are now at like the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Another story says that the ship was forced ashore and crashed and then broke apart uh, in the tides. But all we know is that these highly unusual fossils these really interesting things that could have opened up this whole box about a new type of human were lost. They were lost in the chaos of World War II. And it set back our understanding of fossil extinct human species, you know, by 70 years. But it didn't stop it. Because there was eventually a series of discoveries in a cave in Russia called Denisova, which is why this sort of potential fourth human species are called the Denisovans. Uh, and there's a graduate student standing in Denisova Cave. Now, from a series of finds in Central and East Asia, particularly from the, the cave of Denisova, archaeologists recovered a very small group of bones that seem morphologically and, more importantly, gen uh, genetically distinct. They're not Neanderthals. They're not modern Homo sapiens. At first, it was thought they might be an offshoot of Neanderthals, but that idea has pretty much been squashed. And the current idea is that these are, in fact, a fourth extinct human species. Um, and for years and years, the only real evidence we had of these Denisovans were a series of broken teeth. Uh, and that's one of the broken teeth. And like the first time I gave this lecture on the Denisovans, like that was the that was the largest Denisovan uh, bone that had been recovered. Uh, but this has been followed up by additional discoveries. And current thinking is placing the Denisovans in sort of that green uh, portion of the map right there, East and Southern uh, Asia, and including an area that was overlapped because Apparently, the Denisovans and Neanderthals also interbred. I guess I guess there's just something incredibly sexy about big noses and, and heavy brow ridges. It's the or you know, and now in my mind, every time Neanderthals enter an area, like Barry White music plays, you know, let's get it on. At any rate, um, additional finds have confirmed this is a distinct fourth species. And currently, you know, current year, uh, a number of mandibles have also been found. These are not Neanderthals. They're not Homo sapiens. And while we do not have a complete Denisovan skull, uh, we've, there's been enough finds to kind of build a composite model. 
And that's what you see in the diagram right up above me. Uh, you've got modern humans, Homo sapiens at the top. You have Neanderthals at the bottom. And you can see the Denisovans are somewhere anatomically in the middle. They are not a crossbreed of humans and Neanderthals, but rather they seem to be large-brained Homo erectuses. Homo erectuses colonized India, they colonized China, they colonized that whole sort of band in Asia, and then, you know, adapted locally to those environmental conditions. And again, they're following that drive for larger and larger brains. I don't know what they're going to call it eventually. It has yet to be given an actual scientific name. But yeah, in, in the last 20 years or so, we've gone from thinking there were two types of humans to now knowing there's at least four. Neanderthals, hobbits, Denisovans, and finally, Homo sapiens ourselves. And we're going to deal with the African origin of Homo sapiens in the next section. And I will see you there.